the last, the, the final uh, presenter in this panel is Emily and Godfrey. I um, had been planning to do a presentation on Bartitsu, and then I thought that would just be nonsensical when just along the road in London we have Emily and Godfrey who's done fantastic work on Bartitsu and specifically the, the, the suffragette jiu jitsu of the early 20th century. So, thank you very much for Hi, right, uh, so the first picture. Uh, so we just go forward with the arrow, that's fine, yep. Okay, so you may have heard about this new statue uh, which is going up to this lady here uh, who is on your right, and she's Melissa gant Corset, And she was uh, the organiser of what they call the suffragists, women who were campaigning peacefully for votes for women from the 1860s onwards. Actually, she started the campaign when she was only 19 years old. So it's really timely to actually link in a talk about suffragettes and Bartitz and jiu-jitsu with what's going on next year. And this is really a monument that's going up to Melissa Gant Fawcett. Now her opposing rival force would have been Mrs. Emily Pankhurst. And she, uh, was, she headed the suffragettes of the Women's Social and Political Union. And they were really um, a bit annoyed and quite impatient because by 1903, which when the WSPU, Women's Social and Political Union, were formed, Women still didn't have votes, including many men also couldn't vote. And she thought, let's do something about this. Let's do something headline grabbing. Uh, and so even if that meant actually, you know, um, going against the law, breaking things, damaging property. But Melissa Gant, of course, it continued the campaign peacefully as Emily Pankhurst was doing all this sort of arson and all kinds of setting fire to pillboxes and stuff. So you've got these two women here, and next year also sees a massive anniversary of the passing of the Representation of the People Act, 1918. That's when some women over the age of 30 finally got the vote in Britain. So, um, yeah, that's actually going to be the forthcoming statue, which is the first one to represent powerful women within Parliament Square itself. This is an earlier one, which was put up in the 1920s, and that represents um, Mrs. Mrs. Um, Pankhurst and her daughter Christabel. But that's actually in Victoria Tower Gardens, which is slightly down the road from there. Still recovering from that stressful journey. <laughs> um, and um, yeah, the campaign for Dame Fawcett's statue was backed by some very prominent women, including J.K. Rowling. And I thought it was really fascinating because she wrote a triple decker uh, novel. Hopefully, she brings up more of these ones and turns it into a whole series. But so far, she's written three. Um, and it's the Cormoran Strike uh, Detective series. And there's a lot of discussion on martial arts. Um, boxing, the limits of women's self-defence, the limits of martial arts. So I thought I'd put her in there. It's a nice little link in with the Melissa Gant Corset um, campaign that's going on. So um, it only kind of seems timely to do a talk themed on monuments and also monuments that are um, dedicated to individuals and monuments that you wouldn't have thought of are actually kind of monuments, memorials to the history of jiu-jitsu and Japanese martial arts in the 1900s. And that's one thing I want to highlight in the talk, is things that you didn't know were a memorial to Japanese martial arts in the 1900s. So, I don't think any talk on Bartitsu is complete without this guy here. So that's uh, The Great Detective. It's actually a holiday snap taken by my husband. And um, it's set against the backdrop of the Swiss town of Meiringen, which is the place to buy the rounds. And it's, it's actually a really fantastic kind of area because you go there and you've just got the mountains surrounding you and the Reichenbach Falls, they greet you as you arrive in the town. And that's where Holmes did his battle with Professor Moriarty, his greatest enemy. And actually, in 1903, a story came out uh, called The Adventure of the Empty House, which uh, Conan Doyle was actually pressured to write because a lot of people said, oh, well, Holmes, and if he dies in this tussle with Professor Moriarty, of the Viking Bath Falls, we are not happy about that. Bring him back. So in the event of the empty house, Holmes comes back and he tells the maze Dr. Watson of how he finally he actually survived this particular confrontation. Again, this is really, really atmospheric, this place. You get out here and it's 30 degrees, real heat summer, really hot summer kind of day, and the spray just hits you. It's this cold, intimidating spray. So you can just imagine Holmes standing there on this precipice, wrestling with Moriarty, their feet slipping about. Uh, and that's some kind of dueling to the death there. But actually, his martial art that he used was called Bartitsu, and that was the way that he survived the confrontation with Sherlock Holmes. So, um, one of the major scholars who has really um, brought forward the link between what Baritsu, this is Conan Doyle's misspelling of the form of wrestling that he used to survive the confrontation, and 
Bartitsu actually was, and Richard Bowen was one of the first scholars who really kind of forged that link. I mean, somebody had written about it in the 1950s, but really by the late 20th century, he was writing a lot of articles, including this one here, which was promoting the idea that it was a form of Edwardian martial art. And this particular piece is in the Bowen collection. So I thought I'd really integrate the Bowen collection in here too, because that's actually kept at the University of Bath, up the road, which is where we were this morning, and got lost completely afterwards from sat now. <laughs> and Bartitsu was invented and founded by Edward William Barton Wright. He was an Anglo, um, he was an Anglo um, Irish engineer, Irish, Anglo Scottish, sorry, Anglo Scottish engineer, uh, and he'd stayed in Japan for a while. And he got a bit bored sometimes, and the weather was quite hot. And he thought, well, how do I use my time productively? Let's, you know, learn a form of, of, of martial arts that's intellectual and challenging. And he didn't want to be lazy. He wanted to learn this this new form of self-defence. And so he brought uh, jiu-jitsu to Britain in the 1900s, or very late 19th century. But really to make it marketable, he had to kind of incorporate it in a brand name of his own, which, was, which he called Bartitsu. Uh, and this was, in a sense, uh, a mixture of his own name, Bart, and right of Itsu from jiu-jitsu. And it's also formed of an eclectic uh, variety of martial arts, including Lassabat, which is French kickboxing, as well as boxing. Um, and this is great because it was palatable for the English taste. You know, people knew, oh, this is something quite you know, exotic and interesting. Uh, and it was Japanese, and everything Japanese was very much um, in, on the rage at the time. You know, Japanese, Japanese art. So it was, it was a great kind of media publicity kind of stunt that he pulled. And um, this is one of the particular forms of um, applications that Barton writes. Bartitsu could be used, and uh, this is self-defence with an overcoat. And this is actually a piece that he wrote about for Pearson's magazine. I should probably actually um, read this long section out here because this is actually a piece that he wrote for the magazine, which uh, was a very famous publication that published H.G. Wells' The War of the Worlds. And uh, he wrote, um, another, well, he wrote, uh, we will suppose you have to pass through a locality late at night where there is a likelihood of such an attack, a knife attack, that is. And you do not wish to run the risk of bringing yourself within the law by relying upon a revolver. Carry your overcoat upon your shoulders without passing your arms through the sleeves in the style of a military cloak. Be careful always to walk in the middle of the road. Directly your assailant attacks, face him, and wait until he is within a distance of two or three yards. Then envelop his head and arms by throwing your coat at him, as you can see in the demo there. And, I love these guys. <laughs> These are Rob Temple and Keith Duckland from the Interpretation Department at the Royal Armouries, and they're demonstrating Barton Wright's walking stick self-defence, a method of also keeping the enemy at bay. And Rob and Keith actually gave the first known demonstration of Bartitsu in circa 2004, and they joined forces this weekend for a special Sherlock Holmes event at the Royal Armouries to give another Bartitsu demo. So again, there's lots of timely things happening at the time. It's a great time to organise a conference. So his two-part uh, article, which he promoted, uh, was called The New Art of Self-Defence, How a Man May Defend Himself Against Every Form of Attack. And as I mentioned earlier, that's showcased in Pearson's magazine uh, alongside you know, War of the World, which I kind of see as a sort of self-defence novel in the sense that the Earth defends itself against the mighty Martian invaders with microscopic bacteria. So kind of into <laughs> the galactic jiu-jitsu in a sense. So um, Barton Wright... Uh, founded the Bartitsu School of Arms and Physical Culture, also known as the Bartitsu Club, in the late 1890s on his return from Japan. That's located in Shaftesbury Avenue. Uh, the club attracted experts from around the world, and one notable associate was silver fencing medalist Sir Cosmo Duff Gordon. Uh, he'd later become notorious for escaping the Titanic disaster on a half-empty lifeboat along with his wife. Japanese, uh, his Japanese assistant, uh, Barton Wright's assistant, toured the music halls with him, but broke away from him around 1902, possibly to dis disputes over pay, we don't know exactly. Barton Wright's exorbitant fees appear to have played a role in the club's demise, and he found himself involved in costly legal battles against disgruntled burnt patients. In fact, he actually used asbestos in one of his treatments, which just doesn't bear thinking about. He slipped into obscurity, although his contribution to the development of martial arts in Europe has in recent years been justly acknowledged, as you know about um, Dickie Bowen, Richard Bowen, and the Bowen Collection. 
and also a little memorial here, coming back to the theme of memorials. This was put um, up to um, Barton Wright in Kingston upon Thames because he was um, given a so-called pauper's grave and we don't actually know exactly where he was buried. So one of the members of the bartitsu.org uh, website, uh, they put together a memorial for him. And I thought, I've gone back to, if you'd like to take a photograph of the memorial, then I'm about to change the page to Tony Bull, so I'll just dip a little bit. <laughs> right, um, bartitsu.org is run by Tony Bull, and he, um, he's done a lot really to promote um, Bartitsu since the early 2000s. Uh, and this is a wonderful little picture of him, I just love this, so I just had to include it. In founding Bartitsu, Barton Wright really captured, I think, the zeitgeist of his time. Uh, a major factor in the growth of martial arts, I think, was the cultural shift away from interpersonal violence that we see in the 19th century. So, for instance, in the 18th century, what was called the Bloody Code had been passed, and a lot of, well, 200 crimes or so, property crimes, had been made punishable by death. Whereas the 19th century saw some kind of reversal of that, there was a kind of revulsion towards interpersonal violence. And so uh, we actually see more crimes against the person being uh, more harshly punished, but property crimes, there were a, a number of ways that you could punish them, not just simply by death, so juries were more likely con to convict. Um, and um, so during the 19th century, we see sort of various sort of, um, sort of re reactions to that, such as, for instance, the demise of duelling, which by the 1860s had become deeply unfashionable in Britain. And... Um, especially also attitudes towards how you defend yourself in the streets. So um, in the 1850s and 1860s, there was what was called the garroting panics. A number of people, actually quite a lot of people, oh, this is a nice little picture here too, it's actually showing how to settle disputes in the 1880s. So you have a boxing match instead of blowing each other to bits with dueling pistols. So it's, that really sort of shows the kind of difference in attitudes from the mid 19th century to the end. And then the next slide, I've got lots of pictures in here. <laughs> This is a bit on the anti garrotting um, anti collar, which many people actually invented these crazy homemade weapons in response to uh, this major crime wave that was going on at the time, the garrotting panics of the 1850s and 60s. And what that was was where you had crime um, preceded by strangulation, you'd incapacitate the victim, and then you'd raid their pockets. And you had lots of accounts in the press of men being traumatised by the experience, and one said, I couldn't eat for six weeks apart from using a spoon. So <laughs> it was all kind of in a sense, sort of you had these depictions of men sort of sprawled about without their top hats and watches stolen. And so they invented these kind of homemade devices, and some of them did actually exist. This one's from the Metropolitan Police um, Archives. Uh, and that's a lovely little sort of uh, lampooning kind of um, piece in Punch magazine. There are plays as well about this and novels, you know, which you really sort of said that people are over the top. There are other ways of defending yourself, not just using this kind of stuff. So actually, I think the unique selling point about Bartitsi was that it was weapon free, a tool of self-defense for the thinking man, a connoisseur of culture. Um, and by the time Conan Doyle's Baritsu appeared in Empty House, however, uh, the Bartitsu Club, unfortunately, was a fragment of history, as, as I mentioned earlier. However, Barton Wright's assistants, Sadakazi Uganishi and Yuki Otani, there were a number of them, but I'm going to focus on Uganishi today. Um, they went on to promote jiu-jitsu to the wider British and indeed international public. And I think jiu-jitsu was advertised as suitable for women at a time when the merits of golf and swimming were hotly debated. The idea that cycling could, you know, um, tarnish a woman's reproductive organs, for instance. <coughs> Whereas I couldn't see anything negative so far about jiu-jitsu. There's just nothing on that at all. There are no, ne no negative articles, no medical men worrying about this and that. It's all really good stuff. Um, so, for instance, these words written by Sir Lord Brunton, a founder of modern pharmacology, introduced Emily Watts' book of 1906. This is in the Bowen collection. I just saw that this morning, so I was very excited to see it again. This was the first known book on jiu-jitsu written by a woman in English. And it still remains to be the case. Um, and I quite like the title because it kind of conjures up a sense of refinement, of, um, you know, it's a, it's a skill, it's an art, it's a, it's a graceful form of self-defense. But also there's something really steely and iron about it as well. So what she really knows how to relate to her audience. You know, she's actually a firm grip on her subject. Uh, she says, for instance, you know, now instead of taking regular steps backwards as we start as though for a waltz, each one watching the position of the other, ready to take advantage of a step 
that will make possible any of the throws. So you're going dancing with her, and who knows where that's going to lead to. A bit kind of risque, but also, you know, a bit very in control too. She knows what's going on. She's the woman, she's the teacher. And um, I like the way she also talks about practicing her moves on damp lawns and inclement weather. And it's kind of like, you know, it's a battle between the woman and nature. In a sense, we kind of go back to Sherlock Holmes versus the Reichenbach Falls versus Moriarty. Sherlock trying his hand, trying his best in, you know, um, tough circumstances. And I think what's also hinted at in Watts' assertively written book is also the idea that through their knowledge of martial arts as well as simple self-defence techniques, women can become more confident to step out into the male domain. This is apparent, I think, in a novel called Anne Veronica. It was a big shocker, published in 1909. I kind of see it as very much the Fifty Shades of Grey of its time. And it's got self-defence scenarios in it as well, so I was very excited, particularly jiu-jitsu. There's actually a bit where the heroine, uh, she runs away from home, she joins the suffragettes, she gets followed down the streets in Regent Street, and I'll come to that in a moment, uh, and she has to use her jiu-jitsu skills to ward off a would-be seducer called Rame. She's, she's really quite dodgy. Wells writes, and there's two paragraphs, but it's just really nicely written. She shut her lips hard, her jaw hardened, and she set herself to struggle with him. They began to wrestle fiercely. Each became frightfully aware of the other as a plastic, energetic body, of the strong muscles of neck against cheek, of hands gripping shoulder blade and waist. How dare you, she panted, with her world screaming and grimacing insult at her. How dare you? They were both astonished at each other's strength. Perhaps Ramage was the more astonished. Anne Veronica had been an ardent hockey player and had had a course of jiu-jitsu in the high school. Her defence ceased rapidly to be in any sense ladylike, and became vigorous and effective. A strand of black hair that had escaped its hairpins came, came athwart Ramage's eyes, and then the knuckles of a small but very hardly clenched fist had thrust itself with extreme effectiveness and painfulness <laughs> under his jawbone and ear. So, yeah, he was pretty shocked by the experience. And that was actually published in 1909, as I said before. Um, and by that point, by 1909, September, the militant suffrage campaign was really well underway in Britain. So women were being forced fed by that point, they were hunger striking. Uh, and 1909 was also the year that Edith Garrett became much, much more uh, famous. And she was um, one of the early jiu-jitsu demonstrators. So you've got Emily Watts and then you've got Edith Garrett being one of the early ones. And she really um, was one of the first to kind of apply it to the suffrage campaign. So, you know, how can we use uh, women's self-defence for political uh, uses? So, uh, this is her actually demonstrating um, in her dojo. I've just had to blow the picture up quite a bit because it's kind of getting all the sequence of pictures in as a bit of a challenge. So, um, it's a sequence of six pictures where she throws this guy in the ground. Um, and that's actually in her dojo. So, as well as interrupting political meetings, knocking off policemen's helmets, rushing on the House of Commons, the WSPU, Women's Social and Political Union, under Emily Pankhurst, uh, they also organised peaceful events too, such as at the Prince's Skating Rink. This was a, a charity event, you know, raising money for the cause. And Edith gave her first demonstration to a suffragette audience there. At the last minute, William was taken ill, and Emily Pankhurst said to Edith, you know you can do it, you go up on the stage, you can do it. And she said, oh, I don't know about that. Go on, you do it. And she did a really, really good demonstration, apparently, and the uh, women's uh, magazine actually said that it drew in full houses. And they started to advertise her classes in Folks for Women as a result of that particular demo. So, um, Edith and her husband, William Garrett, had been taught Jiu-Jitsu by Barton Wright's assistant, Sadakazu Uyunishi, who we um, saw earlier. Uyunishi had a dojo or school in Golden Square, and one of Edith's dojos was very close to the famous women's department store, Liberties. Um, and that's actually uh, in that kind of area where, you know, women could unfortunately be stalked like Anne Veronica is in the H.G. Wells novel. And this happened very, very famously in 1887 in June when a dressmaker, you can see her in the middle, so it was a little bit cast, my finger isn't actually long enough, but you can see her in the middle there. And she was walking down the street, 8.30 in the evening, wanted to go and buy a set of uh, gloves for herself because no respectable woman went around without gloves. So she thought, great, shops are open, going to go for a walk. And then this guy... P.C. Bolden Endicott grabs her by the arm and says, I want you, I've been looking for you, and drags her off to the police station. And then the next day, she gets charged with soliciting gentlemen. And she's not been doing anything. She's just been going out and actually respectively buying a pair of gloves of anything. And I thought what was a bit scary was, um, is, that my, is that my phone? <laughs> it's not mine. <laughs> Oops. <laughs> Better not admit that yet. <laughs> and then um, the actual guy who, um, the magistrate who... Um, 
gave a sentence. He said, he really issued this high-handed warning. And he said, now, just you take my advice. If you are a respectable girl, as you say you are, don't walk Regent Street and stop gentlemen at 10 o'clock at night. If you do, you will surely be fined or sent to prison after this caution I have given you. And the media exploded after that. I mean, there were so many letters sent to the press about, what do we do? Where can we walk? Are we going to get arrested by policemen all the time? Uh, and this was really one of the early examples of the tension between, you know, women um, and women's emancipation and the police force. And this was back in the 1880s, so, you know, a couple of decades or so before the WSPU, the Women's Social and Political Union. Uh, now, Edith actually... Um, so there's much discussion, as I've just mentioned. Um, and Edith here herself can really engage with these questions, you know, what should a woman wear, what she should, what she should do, what she's followed. And she came out with a number of articles. This is quite pale. I got this actually rare image. Uh, first, first page of Damsel, Damsel versus Desperado. People think it's disappeared, but I got this from Graham Noble. A guy who lives up north, uh, one of the first um, people to write about Bartitsu in the 1900s, along with Tony Wolfe. And he gave me this copy, and it's really, really faded. But you can kind of see there's a little story there. And the story is all about you know, two scenarios of women walking around in a forest on their own, you know, a handbag dangling around, and then suddenly somebody tries to steal the handbag. Um, and then, you know, they sort of get thrown over the shoulder and stuff. Um, quite how realistic that was is questionable. But nonetheless, it's, it provided a really nice, empowering image of a woman being able to go out, walk down Regent Street, for instance, and take care of herself. Uh, and I think... Um, yeah, so Edith Garrider herself was actually really interested in this whole physical force argument. So she wrote for Votes for Women, and this, kind of, this is where I've taken a quote from the top of my uh, paper, from this particular section here. She writes, Physical force seems the only thing in which women have not demonstrated their equality to men. And whilst we are waiting for the evolution which is slowly taking place and bringing about that equality, we might as well take time by the forelock and use science, otherwise jiu-jitsu. In this art, all are equal, little or big, heavy or light, strong or weak. It is science and agility that will win the victory. But um, is not this a forecast of the future? Science, quickness, vitality and brains are surely equal to brute strength in politics as well as in fights. And it could be dangerous campaigning for the vote. So this is an image of uh, Black Friday. Um, and you've got the women. Uh, this is a very, very famous image, actually. Uh, women on, on the floor, and you've got um, a whole lot of men sort of surrounding her, some of them policemen, some of them street riders. But even just every day, you know, campaigning activities such as, you know, chalking messages, you know, times of meetings on the pavement, that could elicit all kinds of nasty comments. And there was actually a, a nice little obscure letter that was written to one lady who was a suffragette and written to her back in the 1950s, but one, one young woman who remembered the part that her grandfather played in protecting these women who were struggling on the streets. So uh, she writes, I remember too the young girl who sold the paper Votes for Women, that's the WSBU um, periodical, standing on the corner outside the shop every Sunday, Saturday. My grandfather, then a dignified old man in his 80s, who had always been an advocate of adult suffrage, used to go and stand beside this girl. I think he felt that he afforded her some protection from insults from passers-by. He would point out to anybody who did pass insulting remarks that he had watched women try to get the vote and other justices for themselves by constitutional means for over 40 years without success and now supported any action they took to attain, attain their ends. So the Women's Social and Political Union did have friends, male friends, outside the campaign. Whether or not a woman used her jiu-jitsu skills, being prepared to defend herself physically may have given her more confidence. And some suffragettes who were also trained in martial arts supplemented their training um, by wearing cardboard armour to protect themselves in fights with the police and riders. One suffragette who wore cardboard armour and learnt martial arts was Kitty Willoughby Marshall, who was a very close friend of Mrs Pankhurst, and she really interests me quite a bit. Um, and uh, she really spearheaded the project to commemorate Mrs Pankhurst in the form of the statue that you saw at the very beginning of this talk. By Kitty's jiu-jitsu, jiu um, uh, Kitty's jiu-jitsu instructor, Edith Garrett, had become somewhat of a celebrity, by about 1910 or so. Uh, you may know this famous cartoon here, which is called um, The Suffragette That Knew Jiu-Jitsu. It's on the internet, and, um, it's, but it's not actually Edith Garrett, as many people think. It's a representation of a woman with martial arts skills. So 
So at the, at the ground you can see there's a dog whip. A number of women used these ones in the campaign for defence and attack as well. This Winston Churchill was one of the recipients of that. <laughs> and then um, and you've got two, a hat as well there that she's dropped. It's almost kind of suggesting she's lost her hat. She, she, her hat, she's lost her head in a sense. It's crazy. But then she's got, you know, she's got a bit of something powerful going on because all these policemen are cowering in the background. And Edith actually loved this particular image. Um, and uh, her, ne- her grandnephew Martin Williams was really keen to put this one um, in the centre of, of his campaign to um, put a memorial to her uh, in Islington when the memorial went up a few years ago. So it's very, very tiny, but you might just about be able to see Edith Garrett, the suffragette that knew Jiu Jitsu, lived here, number 60, Thornhill Square. And uh, yeah, unveiling was fun that day. It was actually, it, it was a really bright, sunny day. Weekend morning, these are all her descendants here, female descendants, and the local council in the picture. And then the guy who owned the house, so he just sort of stepped out and obviously been out late the night before, you know, sort of holding a cup of tea and like, oh, what's going on here? So I just had to put him in there because he's nowhere at all. He's not represented anywhere, so I thought I'd better give him a voice as well. <laughs> so, um, yeah. And there's another um, memorial to her as well in Islington, and that's actually by the tube uh, bus and tube station. So that's actually where I did my very first women's self-defence course. So it's kind of, for me, quite sentimental because that's how I first got interested in this subject, right around the corner from where the statue got put up. And Martin Williams, you can see him. He's, he's that guy on the right there. And uh, Edith Gannis just behind him. So there's her represented behind the bench. While campaigning for the statue, um, Martin delved into Edith's family background and told me that she had Welsh and Bath heritage. So I kind of wanted to find out a little bit more about where she actually came from. And a lot of this is still a work in progress, but uh, I did manage to track down her birth certificate, which came in the other week in the post, and that's really interesting because Martin had said that she was illegitimate, but there was no information on that, and so um, it took a bit of finding to find out, you know, how to actually order the birth certificate, but here it is. You've got Clara Williams, that's her mum there, and she um, was a piano teacher, um, and that's actually, she's actually in the census about a year before Edith was born. And then there's no father name there at all, which that may well be suggested. But so she was born in Bath in the Lansdowne district, so not too far from, from where we are. And uh, yeah, another Edith Garrett mystery I find was what happened to her scrapbook. And she proudly shows this off to a number of people, this particular scrapbook. So there, there it's going, she's showing it off um, to um, Mr. Professor Nakanishi, who'd come over from Japan. He came over a number of times to the Buddha Clive. And that's particularly one incident of that. And she's showing it off to him there, but then she's also showing it to a journalist in the 1960s called Godfrey Wynn. So she was clearly proud of it, and she'd actually reproduced the um, punch image of suffragette that we do jitsu, which we saw earlier. So I'd love to find out where that went to, but none of her descendants know, so that is a work in progress. And he was actually kind of interesting because he was a specialist in commerce and marine transportation. Um, and there's a lot of information um, in the Tudor magazine on him, which Mike Callan kindly passed on to me uh, a few months ago, because I was actually looking for the rest of this article. I only had this bit here and this bit. I didn't know where on earth the rest of it came from, so I was very pleased to get in touch with him. So another couple of minutes. Um, yep. Edith's dojos were a female-friendly space, uh, and the Argyle Place one, which is where she had her dojo, was indeed a vault hall, an escape for suffragettes fleeing the police following window smash campaigns. Her role within the WSPU really intensified, um, and the liberals in power, they started to panic because a lot of women were hunger, thirst and sleep striking in prison. And they thought, oh no, we don't want to martyr to the cause. So they ended up passing the Prisoners Temporary Discharge for Ill Health Act, 1913, um, often called the Cat and Mice Act. Though actually the guy who really put this, shunted this particular act forward, um, McKenna, the Home Secretary, is the only one who actually knows how to spell it correctly. Everyone tends to put an apostrophe after a prisoner and they get very wound up by that. But, uh, but there it is, that's particularly one there, so all the terms of that one. Uh, and one of the terms was that if a woman was released um, to recover sufficiently before she got called back to prison, um, she had to tell the authorities where she was so that they could come and take her back, back to prison again. But a lot of women, as you can imagine, didn't want to do that, and especially Mrs Pankhurst. So she actually had a bodyguard, a group of women, who would protect her from police re-arrest. And Edith's job was to train that group of bodyguard. And Kitty Marshall, who'd put up the statue to Mrs. Pankhurst, 
she was one of the members of the bodyguard as well as being her um, one of her best friends and she wore cardboard armor so it all gets really quite exciting uh, and this is the last page of the talk um, so we've got the bodyguard and you may have seen the film suffragette in which the bodyguard briefly appears uh, so this is Helena Bonham Carter, one of the early release pictures from when they were shooting the film, um, practising her moves here. And she was really inspired by Edith Gaz and actually wanted to have her character named Edith um, Ellen, Edith, uh, in honour of Edith Garrard. Um, and um, yeah, so she was also known as Madame Garrard as well by the press too. And the police were not learning jiu-jitsu, so it became really important that the suffragettes became adept at the martial arts. Um, this is the last page here, I think, yeah. So, for instance, at one of the um, confrontations, one of the police officers writes about it, um, and he actually talks about one jiu-jitsu confrontation, and there aren't many discussions of that. There's, I've not seen any so far in the press, anything so far in any of the secondary sources, but I find this one autobiography, and it's unpublished. And so, <laughs> I was really excited to see it. It's one of the descendants has given me the autobiography, and he says, he talks about a fight with the police began, this is in West London, and some of the bodyguard were soon using their Indian clubs this is also part of the martial arts training that Edith offered, Indian clubs and jiu-jitsu. Unfortunately for one of them, and for one of the officers, she was not very expert in the use of the club, for when she aimed a blow at one of the policemen who had another woman in charge, and he ducked away from her, the blow she had aimed missed him and fell on the head of another suffragette, who had later to receive medical attention. So, not great press there for the suffragettes. These are actually his personal mem memoirs. Um, but perhaps we will give Edith the last word in this talk. As she later related in an interview, she also used her martial arts skills against the police, uh, and she thought this was a particularly useful method of dealing with the bobby on the beat. She writes, One policeman said to me, Now then, move on, you can't start causing an obstruction here. Excuse me, she said, it's you who are making an obstruction. Then I pretended, she says, to drop my handkerchief. The next moment he was over my shoulders, and while all his mates were restoring his winded body to its feet, I escaped into the crowd that was collecting to see the fun. I'm afraid he must have felt sore for many a day. Thank you. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Um, so we have three <coughs> talks in this panel, so shall we take questions? Shall we move over for the other speakers to come out the front? I guess so. If, um, if you want to, to come out to the front, we can like to have one. And then we'll, we'll do the questions till about 42, I think. The adrenaline is now <laughs> calmed down, yeah. Um, I find it really interesting. Um, I'm somewhat familiar with this, some of the stories that you've you touched on. Thanks for having such questions here. Um, <coughs> When I've read about this before, when I've thought about it before, and a lot of things you've said today, it uh, seems that the bodyguard were using jiu-jitsu fundamentally to assist the politics of, of what the suffragettes were doing mm. in terms of the demonstrations. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things that I'm quite interested in is, beyond that, was, was the jiu-jitsu, the, the act of uh, you know, like a woman fighting, a woman able to fight a policeman, in terms of the politics of the body that that represents, was that impactful in any way at the time? I mean, obviously the focus of all of this was on the right to vote, but in terms of why the gender party, it's thinking about, um, I mean, it's just sort of happening at the same sort of time that physical education for women was being established and mm -hmm. changing over there. Was, you, in, your, in your research, have you seen that the specific training in jiu-jitsu of these women, did that have a, an impact beyond simply assisting the suffragette group? Did that have a sort of certain wave in, in uh, I think there's a number of sort of kind of, um, sort of ways you can look. I suppose the impact of suffrage campaigning and getting out on the streets and getting that confidence to go out on the streets as well, knowing you have the secret weapon. Um, one or two suffragettes wrote later on after their war work, and they said, well, it wasn't, it was actually, it wasn't really the war work as such that was something that was empowering for them. It was the suffrage campaign and all the sort of physical dangers that they had to put their bodies through to actually, um, which really gave them the kind of confidence to, um, you know, sort of partake in this dangerous war work. So in a sense, it's actually, um, and you could look at it in that sense, what they, what they put themselves through physically. Um, but what was interesting is also that 1910 was the year of the hobble skirt, and that's when Edith Garrett became famous. 
to these two kind of images of women's bodies at the time. You had her doing all of her stuff, and then you had the hobble scot, which had you know, sort of it, depictions in Punch magazine of women sort of saying, oh, Mabel, we're not going to catch that train. You have to hobble faster. <laughs> So you've got these two kind of depictions going on at the same time. That's something that I'm really interested in researching in a bit more. And that's actually a work in progress. I'm writing a book at the moment. One of the themes is actually looking at the bodyguard and looking around some of the, um, you know, the influences of that on women's physical emancipation. But definitely in terms of, you know, how sort of jiu-jitsu uh, was seen as health-giving and beneficial and graceful and ideal form of the exercise for, for the women, whereas, you know, it was kind of all these other sports and cycling, we've quite a bit of a debate about that. There's actually a programme on Women's Hour, which uh, was on a few days ago, exactly on the history of cycling and reproductive organs and stuff. So I just didn't really see anything negative about that and jiu-jitsu, and I thought that in itself was kind of liberating. I've yet to find anything negative, but there must be something out there from the 1900s. What are your thoughts, by the way? That's a pretty good chat, after all. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, in relation to lineage, there were Bath and Wright uh, school clubs, and the, after, after the vote was cast for, for women, the well, initial, initial restricted vote. I'm not sure if there, some people continue to teach and practice, and therefore yeah. the arts will pass down for a lineage almost like, so my teacher's teacher, teacher. Yeah. I don't mm. know, like many martial arts. I'm not sure about that. I think what's been used. Yeah, you look at this sort of lineage, so you've got Barton Wright, then you've got Ian Ishii, then you've got William Garrod. William Garrod teaches Edith. Edith continues to teach into the 20s, and um, there's evidence that she was still working then. Uh, I'm not sure, I mean, William Garrod was one of the authorities as well. I'm not sure quite after, afterwards who she influenced from the 1920s onwards, um, but she was still teaching, and I think she ended up like teaching scouts in the end. Of one of her, so, um, her descendants were saying she remembered her as a scout leader, so who knows that she might have influenced them in that kind of way as well. So, but yeah, again, that's something to sort of think about the lineage there. Um, so beyond the kind of topic, also a number of the... Um, I mean, we don't know much about Ionishi's movements once he moved back to Japan. Um, circa 1906, 1907. We're, we're not sure um, everything, you know, all the stuff he was doing then, but um, was some, some of the other people in the movement, like Yuki Otani, for instance, you know, he sort of went on to have, have quite a career again. And so, um, yeah, who did they influence that? That's the question. I think it's actually easier to work that out from looking at materials at the, at the Bowen collection because you sort of see the correspondences and you know, this person knew that person. And then Dickie Bowen, actually, I forgot to mention, he knew Edward William Barton Wright, and he remembered the electrical light treatment cures that he had in his, um, in his house in Kingston. So, again, that's kind of a... And I almost met Dickie, I almost met Dickie Bowen as well because there was a voicemail that was left um, by one of his friends, and he passed away just at that time when he left the voicemail. So I talk about lineage here. It's quite interesting that um, Kotara Yamu was talking about, which you just missed, you are no, frantically no, no. running in, but um, that's talked about that in, the <laughs> in, in the United States at the same kind of time. Mm -hmm. did, did they call it jujitsu fever in the press? Or is this something that we use now? Do, do, but do historians talk about the jujitsu fever of the 1900s in America? Or did they use that term at, at the time? Mm, I think so, but the, the most popular, uh, most uh, big river occurred in America. Ah, Jiu Jitsu Fever was, ah, eh, so the Judo in the U.S. という本の中で使われている表現です。その同時代のあの新聞記事ではそういった表現を使われてます。うん、フィーバーという表現はしてないです。ストーンとか、okay, そういう表現をしています。Fever in contemporary newspaper articles, although they did refer to the storm, they had their weather metaphors apparently. Okay, so it's more of a Historians look back now and say there was a jiu-jitsu craze. Maybe we'll be talking about the kung fu craze in the 1930s or something. There's all those images of politicians and women practicing jiu-jitsu in the, you know, the, white, the white house outside. So again, so yeah, I see it being very, very, very popular in the US. Yeah. Mm. I, guess the, I guess the other thing is, in the States it was 
judo was a big thing, but you're saying jiu-jitsu was the, the thing. Judo was less in, in Britain, maybe? Although some people are saying that there are elements of judo in Emily Watts' book, even though it's called The Fine Art of Jiu-Jitsu. So some of the experts, like sort of Tony Will, have actually been saying, well, yeah, there's a bit of judo element. And judo starts to come in as well, even though it's been sort of under that, marketed as that kind of umbrella of jiu-jitsu. So that's sort of the early kind of... Um, so in that sense, it's, you have to literally read every one of the books and sort of disentangle what the moves are, and is that more judo move, or...? Um, in, in regards to that, uh, so jiu-jitsu took the US by storm, and in the early 1900s, uh, all the examples I've heard today and read of previously today are all throws. And I was wondering if, do they throw and it's over, or do they throw and run away, or are there ever submissions mentioned? Or what happens after a throw? That's so, a uh, unlike a movie, when you throw someone, they don't die. Uh, <laughs> so I'm wondering if there's ever any mention of that. Well, there's a police manual of just started reading, and he does talk about submissions, and then he actually says, well, people don't really know about submissions in the UK, so I'll tell you exactly all about it. And I stopped at that page yesterday, but I'm kind of halfway through the book, and it's just been passed on to me. Um, it was a, a guy who did training for the City of London Police, um, Wielden was the surname, um, so again, that's a work in progress there, but uh, he does actually talk about submissions in that, so that might be something to, to check out as well, and he talks about people's attitudes towards that. <laughs> <laughs> Question in relation to the Korean martial arts. Yeah. And I looked at the myth of the flying kick, so I was expecting, like, oh, against horses and, and not good in martial arts, so they talk about this when you were a Yeah, but why, why were <laughs> flying kicks developed? So I don't know if you know much about the development. Oh, no, no. Just a disallow that question. <laughs> Do you really want to talk about flying kicks? No. <laughs> <laughs> In the, in the, in the modern, modern market, yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 This is Yeah. 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 Yeah, they developed in a different uh, story to make it uh, legitimate. So it uh, really doesn't match uh, to uh, historical circumstances. Uh, I'm sorry for that. Uh, <laughs> 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 that's what keeps you in business. Should we have one quick one? Because then we need a break before the final session. Let's see what, one last quick question. There's also a question for the Korean part. Yeah. Uh, I was really intrigued actually by the drawings that you, that you showed and uh, the way movement is depicted, because most of the, the um, drawings I know from the, from the early period, you don't see actually movements, and you don't see a development, you have like, like very static, and by having this kind of thing that you could follow this line, it also very much reminded me of depictions of um, the, the uh, tours of Daimyo, where you can see like, like the people in Rome, and then how they will proceed. But, but that was in the Korean source. Do you have any idea where this kind of showing development and technique, so the materiality of, of the body, that is also part here, uh, where, this, where does it come from? Is it, uh, the, I think the first uh, manual depicted <coughs> the human movement as a martial artist way is General Chi Ji Huang. Mm. So he introduced this, uh, uh, the human postures to explain the, how the techniques is composed of. After that, I think the, I showed the uh, Muye Jebo in Korea, 1598. That is, as, a, as far as I know, that is the, the oldest manual to show the kata yeah. style, the series of uh, techniques. And uh, from this uh, perspective, and we talk about the secrets, and uh, actually there was uh, no secret from Korean side, then they want to promote. Even they translate in uh, Korean, and then uh, most uh, soldiers, they cannot actually, they cannot read the classical Chinese at that time. Mm -hmm. So they, they read these uh, Korean uh, characters, and then even small, uh, handy uh, 
uh, version. Mm -hmm. So they carry uh, this uh, sleeve, mm -hmm. and then they practice uh, sometimes take out oil. Yeah, I, I did it where. <laughs> <laughs> but okay, yeah, we, so should, we, should, we should stop. Sorry. Yeah. We, we can continue because we will be going to the club in a little while. But um, thank you everyone for this panel. We, we will take a 10 minute break, so there should be coffee and soft drinks and toilets. Thank you very much.